Hello, my beautiful doves. My name is Mina, and lately I've been thinking a lot about this idea of self confidence. I love how I just put self confidence in air quotes like it doesn't exist. No, it exists. That's not what this video is about. But okay, let me let me try to start again. I was watching Euphoria season two. I made a review. That's one video back, so you can check it out if you haven't seen it already. But um, I was watching Euphoria, and there was this one scene that really stood out to me. Every day you get out of bed. It's an act of courage. That's easy for you to say. You don't have like fucking mental problems. Cat, you need to smash all beauty standards. But I can't even get out of bed. I myself struggled with a lot of self love and self confidence growing up, usually instigated by, you know, my friends all having boyfriends except for me, or just not feeling brave enough to raise my hand in class to say what I really wanted to say, feeling like I wasn't invited to enough parties or that I didn't have enough friends, or the fact that I never really figured out how to successfully network. And these are like all common things that I think people struggle with. And there's this common misconception as well that the solution to all these problems is confidence. Like you're just not confident enough. And once you get to a level of confidence, all your problems will just magically vanish. I'm sure you've tried at times to go, well, I need to be confident. I know I should be confident, but you're still not there. We take people through a first evening we call fear into power. We use a firewalk experience where everyone walks across the fire between 1,200 and 2,000 degrees burning hot coals. Um, chill. Anyway, so. I'm sure a lot of you have heard phrases like, fake it till you make it. Or, um, how are you gonna love someone if you don't love yourself? And yada, 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 yada. And to a degree, there is some truth in those phrases. I look at scammers like Anna Delvey, who was able to fake it till she ended up in jail. But the point is, she was so sure of the identity that she created for herself. She was able to mislead people for months and months and months into thinking that she was this like multi-millionaire German heiress with a trust fund who didn't know how to spend her money. Um, meanwhile, she grew up in a middle class household and was previously working as a fashion intern. Oh, I totally know that girl. Oh, really? In a small world. I feel like the idea of inner confidence has been pitched to us as this foolproof solution for so long now that it's become so inescapable. And honestly, it's kind of even cult-like. Sociologist Rosalind Gill and Professor Shani Orgod introduced the idea of confidence as a cult in their new book, Confidence Culture. In an interview with Vox, Rosalind described this idea pretty succinctly. It's like a cult in the way that it's been placed beyond debate. Who could be against confidence? Nobody could possibly argue against it because it's so taken for granted. I think it's good to be suspicious of the things that get placed in that space where they can't be interrogated at all. It was also just a culture in the way that it's saturated right across society. It was disseminated so, so widely. Shani adds in the same interview, the women I spoke to describe it as something that isn't tangible. When you ask them, where did you get these expectations that you should be the confident mother and the full-time worker who's assertive? They say, it's everywhere. It becomes so unquestioned that it's being internalized into the most intimate sphere, whereby women, often very painfully, judge themselves according to this unattainable expectation. So let's take a look at some of the stats here. In 2015, according to the Pew Research Center, more millennials reported making personal improvement commitments than any generation before them. Millennials spend twice as much as boomers on self-care essentials such as workout regimens, diet plans, life coaching, therapy, and apps to improve their personal well-being. Over the years, we've also had a rise in terms like being a girl boss. These stairs represent my success, constantly going up. Breaking through the glass ceiling. Ow. <laughs> The idea that women need to lean in when sitting at the table. Statistics get passed around saying that men are more confident in the workspace. They uh, ask and negotiate for higher salaries. They are overall more commanding in their lack of vocal fry and inability to apologize. Interestingly, there's also this slant um, in the confidence discourse where powerful and successful women are now opening up about their previous insecurities and their imposter syndromes in a way that's supposed to come off as inspirational. 
But the two writers also challenged this idea, saying many incitements to confess one's insecurities ignore the structural sources of vulnerability, such as poverty, ill health, racism, and sexism. And many of the celebrities divulging their feelings of inadequacy or business leaders sharing their failures are doing so from a place of security because their struggles are located safely in the past. I have the best advice for women in business. Get your fucking ass up and work. That's so true. So now that we've established what the cult of confidence is, let's get into the cultural ramifications. <laughs> this video is sponsored by HelloFresh. HelloFresh delivers meal kits consisting of fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes right to your door. I got into this rut of eating questionably healthy dinners at ungodly hours because I'm so busy throughout the day with work and class, but HelloFresh saves me trips to the grocery store and the time spent searching for recipes online. I'm also a big fan of how HelloFresh delivers fresh produce sourced directly from farmers and how their pre-portioned ingredients encourage less food waste, which are really important concerns I have for the food industry. HelloFresh also has different customizable options like pescatarian, veggies, meat and veggies, etc. Here I'm making warm butter shrimp rolls. I ordered the pescatarian option. I'm honestly not a huge fan of cooking, but HelloFresh makes it so quick and easy and the end result tastes great. Go to HelloFresh.com and use code MINA16 for up to 16 free meals and three surprise gifts. Mmm. <laughs> it's pretty good. I'm woke. Woke, woke. I'm so, why aren't my jeans? Woke washing, similar to green washing and pink washing, is a type of performative capitalism. Companies these days often brand themselves as being woke either by posting like a Black Lives Matter post on Instagram or by showing a diverse range of models in their ad campaigns because they know being more progressive is a uh, monetizable these days. Like that's what people expect from the companies they buy from, a certain level of political awareness. But the reason this is all performative is because 99% of the time, what the values these companies are championing on the surface level are not being reflected in the company's internal structures. For example, in 2015, an anonymous writer published a piece on Jezebel that went viral, and the title of the article was Lululemon Diaries, My Life in an Exploitative Libertarian Happiness Cult. In this article, the writer talks about her experience as an educator, which is the term that Lululemon uses to basically just describe the position of a salesperson. And for any of you who don't know, Lululemon is an activewear company most popular for having a strong grip on the yoga pants slash flared leggings market in the early 2010s. This person also talks in their article about how at Lululemon, there's this idea of everything being your choice. So if a customer is being rude to you, it is your choice to be offended. They even talk about this one customer who got so angry at them and who was screaming and spitting in their face. And when they reported it to their manager, their manager said that it was their choice to be offended by getting screamed at and spit at. Girl, you have done it again. Constant lowering in the bar for us all. They write pretty strongly that even when it's a matter of safety, like someone following out an educator to their car, Lululemon did not care. They write, when you start, if you're not a college graduate or someone who just needs a part-time retail job or a person who's like a dancer or yogi supplementing their income, you're made to feel wrong for your scheduling, for needing time off for children, or for noticing the many OSHA violations. Lululemon tells you every single day, educators are the most important people in the company. People believe it too, especially if they've never worked for anyone else. But while snacks, free yoga classes, and a clothing discount is great, those aren't the benefits that matter. That doesn't help people buy groceries or plan for retirement. And perhaps this is most telling of former founder Chip Wilson's own ideology on how he allegedly didn't believe in public assistance or welfare and that only people who were entrepreneurial would be successful in life. So I've never worked at Lululemon and I haven't been to one ever. Like I don't think I've ever stepped foot in a Lululemon. So I don't know if the working environment has changed ever since this article was released because it was a pretty scathing article. But it goes to show that unless a brand is called out for doing something wrong, they will do whatever they want behind closed doors, all while pushing for these wonderful and amazing progressive values on the surface. Similarly, ultra fast fashion brand Boohoo claims to be all about body positivity and female self-confidence, but according to British newspaper The Sunday Times, which published an undercover investigation, workers in a factory in 
Leicester um, that supplied Boohoo were being paid as little as three pounds and 50 cents an hour. Um, please note that the national living wage in Britain for ages 25 and above is eight pounds and 72 cents. <laughs> The article also said that workers were working without proper equipment um, to protect against COVID. Nasty Gal, a clothing company that had previously branded itself as this girl power slash strong woman brand, also had a publicized scandal in 2015. According to BuzzFeed News, Nasty Gal had terminated multiple pregnant women when these women announced that they were pregnant. And this has pretty bad repercussions because terminating these women also meant that these women were losing their health insurance. Another ex-employee, Farah Saberi, claims that she was let go after being diagnosed with a kidney disease that forced her to go um, take off five weeks for her surgery. She claims that the loss of her job also compromised a lot of her medical bills because, once again, her insurance was taken away. So I could keep going on forever because There have been so many companies that have had these little scandals like Abercrombie & Fitch and Brandy Melville and American Apparel. There's so many of these companies that claim to be about something and then you find out that they're breaking all kinds of rules when it comes to how they treat their salespeople. What's more is that a lot of beauty, skincare, and diet companies create this link between confidence and outer appearance as if true confidence can only come from looking a certain way. In the Vox interview, Rosalind criticizes Dove, the beauty brand, for wokewashing their campaigns. She says the whole company is premised on exploiting women's insecurities, selling products targeted at that. It also has a post-racial tenor in the way it flattens our differences to make them seem as if they're all on one plane and as relevant as each other while appropriating social justice language. It takes all the differences and empties them out of their meaning and appears that, say, being pregnant is as significant as being disabled. Yeah, a lot of beauty companies will run these campaigns well they'll have a bunch of multi-ethnic models and each model will say like the same thing they'll say like my beauty matters or something very generic and basic and Rosalind argues that by having every single model say the same thing um, regardless of what they look like gives the implication that we live in a post-racial society because in reality um beauty is going to have a different meaning for a trans woman, for an Asian woman, for a disabled woman, for a pregnant woman. In our society, we have all dealt with different degrees and types of marginalization, and we're all treated differently depending on how we look on the outside. And these companies tend to gloss over these differences and in the end, not add anything actually relevant to the conversation. And on top of that, these companies do not address the systemic issues that cause us to feel uh, less confident to begin with. I remember coming across this post that just made me very angry. I'm going to read it to you all so you all can be very angry with me. Mercedes S. Johnson said on, I think this is Facebook. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't used Facebook in a really long time. So, Hello, darkness, my old friend. They write, I just offered a candidate $85,000 for a job that had a budget of $130,000. I offered her that because that's what she asked for. And I personally don't have the bandwidth to give lessons on salary negotiation. Here's the lesson. Always ask for the salary you want, in parentheses, deserve. No matter how large you think it might be, you never know how much money a company has to work with. Hashtag be confident. What's wrong with you? Okay, if you work in HR and you know your company has a budget that is double what this person you want to hire is asking for, just give them the budget that was allocated for the position. (laughs) Like, If you've been applying for dozens and dozens of jobs and you haven't heard back from any of them and you have a rent payment due and you finally get called in and this person is sitting there offering you a job You're not going to play some kind of mind game with your prospective employer because there are some employers out there who will just not offer you the job if you ask for a salary that's too high. Some employers are like that. They just don't want to spend any time negotiating with you if you really overshoot what their budget is. And that would suck. And you would just like not get the job. So sometimes people just want the job so badly that they are willing to take whatever is offered to them. It's not that hard of a concept to understand. So no, I don't think uh, 
being confident is like the be all end all solution for this. As Beth Daly writes for The Conversation, take the pandemic's devastating and disproportionate economic impact on women, including increased unemployment, the scaling back of paid work, and the widening gender pay gap. In response, workplace schemes have offered confidence training courses and advice for women, while organizations, life coaches, and lifestyle media implore women to believe in themselves, fill your own cup first, and remember that confidence is a work in progress. Thus, instead of holding government workplaces, corporations, and the education system to account, confidence culture calls on women to work on themselves in order to tackle their imposter syndrome, change the way they think, feel, communicate, hold their bodies, and occupy space. The reality is people who live in poverty are more likely to suffer from depression, and according to a study by the Mental Health Foundation, the poorest fifth of the UK population are twice as likely to develop mental health problems than those on average incomes. A study from researchers at UCLA found that young adults who endure frequent interpersonal discrimination based on race, sex, or physical appearance are at greater risk of mental health issues than those who don't. These authors also analyzed data from a 10-year survey and found that people ages 18 to 28 who experience consistent short or long-term discrimination are 25% more likely to experience psychological distress, to be diagnosed with a mental illness, or to report excessive drug use. I'm, by the way, reporting these statistics because I really want to show how, you know, this confidence deficit is a systemic issue. There are systemic reasons for why people are low confident and the only way to raise people's overall self-esteem is our our to fix is to gram, literally having a grammatical grammatical brain fart right now um is to focus on fixing these structural issues not only are marginalized people more likely to suffer from mental health issues, they are less likely to be able to afford to get better. Black mental health advocates have also been talking for a long time now about how the U.S.'s national public health care system leaves very, very few options for culturally competent care. Only 3% of the country's psychology workforce is black, and the community-based clinics that do exist are severely underfunded. And this is a problem because according to Mesa Akbar, the author of Urban Trauma, A Legacy of Racism, black communities sometimes shy away from seeking treatment for mental and physical illnesses in fear of experiencing racism by workers and doctors in these healthcare systems. There's also empirical evidence that a lot of healthcare professionals are fat phobic and they will let their negative biases affect how they diagnose their patients which also leads a lot of fat people to not getting uh, the health care that they need. Activist Sonia Renee Taylor recounted, I threw my back out three and a half years ago and I was in excruciating pain and the physician just looked at my chart and said, just take a couple of Tylenol. Doctors deny fat patients pain or minimize their pain or deny them pain management treatment because some doctors believe that some bodies, namely fat bodies, deserve the pain they're in. And you know, this goes across like, so many different communities like there's a lot of transphobia in healthcare systems there's a lot of misogyny in the healthcare systems a lot of people are just not taken seriously which is why a lot of people will not get treatment what do you do on those days that you don't feel that confident or fearless or powerful like you did out there uh pretend fake it yeah until we make it i mean why not it's either <laughs> that or cry myself to sleep who wants to do that you wake up with puffy eyes the next day that's a waste <laughs> So in saying all that, taking care of yourself can be a very radical act, especially if you live in a country like the U.S. that doesn't have accessible or uh, culturally competent health care available for a lot of people. So yeah, sometimes like you just got to do things yourself. But the problem is that the online self-care community is very elitist and classist. Hashtag self-care um, first hit mainstream in 2016 with the term spiking in Google searches uh, the week following the election. There was such an insurgence of virtual self-care content that year that The Atlantic even ran a guide to online self-care guides. Now in 2022, I feel like the term self-care is not as buzzy and not as like new as it once was uh, back in the mid 2010s. For example, there's less, you know, self-care guides on the internet being published, but in lieu of them, there's now like, you know, 50 self-affirmations to say to yourself in the morning or how to be that girl or 30 best skincare products. 
I would argue that all these things can be put under the umbrella of the self-care movement, which is connected to our universal desire to improve ourselves, to be our most confident, most intelligent, most beautiful selves. Self-care is also heavily tied in with spending money, like buying detox teas and manifestation journals and uh, $30 fitness classes and bath bombs, green smoothies, green juices, matcha lattes, um, you name it. Ironically, the term self-care actually rose in the black community as black activists um, pushed for a way to deal with systemic oppression. Self-care in this original sense was a form of protest and was also supposed to be aligned with community care, which is exactly what it sounds like, um, caring for your community. You may or may not have heard the famous Audre Lorde quote that's been unfortunately co-opted and taken out of context numerous times. Caring for myself is not self-indulgence, it is self-preservation, and that is an act of political warfare. Kathleen Newman Bremming wrote for Refinery29, self-care cannot be an act of political warfare if the only battle you're waging is against your frown lines with a $110 moisturizer. My personal problem with a lot of this uh, self-care marketing these days is that uh, a lot of people, namely women and femmes, are told that they have to follow a certain routine in order to get to their highest self. And all these steps in the routine have to do with spending money. And if you don't have the money, you're shit out of luck. You're never going to manifest your goals. You're not going to get your romantic partner of your dreams. You're not going to have the career of your dreams. You know, it's like tying this idea that your quality of life in the future is heavily dependent on these very uh, arbitrary, costly steps you take today. A lot of the criticism towards the that girl trend, which was big on TikTok in the past year, it's basically an aesthetic lifestyle revolving around waking up at 5 a.m. to do Pilates, drinking green juices, going to the farmer's market, and wearing beige athleisure. Things that we associate with having your life together and looking good while doing it. But a lot of the criticism was about how that girl was unattainable for anyone living paycheck to paycheck. And while I think you can aestheticize yourself in any way that you like, as long as it's not offensive to any particular groups, I think it is kind of sad that there's this one very privileged lifestyle that has been overblown into being the pinnacle of confident, confidence, sexiness, and beauty. And the irony is that a lot of these self-care things that people are advertising are also just scams. None of these guides really help you if you're struggling with an actual mental illness. Sure, it's great to be reminded to drink water. Um, water is never a bad idea, but these clickable, Instagrammable suggestions are not going to help you unpack your childhood trauma or deal with stressful situations. And do not get me started on Instagram therapists either. Oh my God, I have like, I have such a bone to pick with a lot of Instagram therapists because I, I think it's a total scam. For anyone who doesn't know, like the Instagram therapist is someone who posts an infographic that says a quote that's very basic, like uh, analyzing your life problems is a uh, coping mechanism for dealing with pain. I don't know, something very, very general that could be applied to a lot of different people. They're like the horoscopes of the mental health community. As someone who's been in therapy um for therapy to actually work you have to talk about your personal life experiences and whatever advice your therapist is going to give you is going to be tailored to the story that you share with them because everyone's life experience is different you can't just have this like bullshit generic advice work for everyone because everyone has a different experience none of these instagram therapists know anything about any specific person that they're preaching to and therefore their advice is just very like you could find that stuff on a fortune cookie anyways as Lori penny writes for the baffler the harder duller work of self-care is about the everyday and possible effort of getting up and getting through your life in a world that would prefer you cowed and compliant a world whose abuse of logic wants you to see no structural problems but only problems with yourself or with those more marginalized and vulnerable than you are okay Thank you, everyone, for sticking around. That's all I have for today. Um, let me know in the comments. Oh, my God. The sun is, like, shifting around. Hopefully, that wasn't happening throughout my whole video. It'd be a disaster. Um, 
yeah okay thank you all so much for joining me uh let me know in the comments what you think about the cult of confidence what you think about anything i just said in the video these are all things that I've been thinking about for a long time, but I finally felt catalyzed to do a video on it after watching Euphoria, ironically. So yeah, um, I hope you have a lovely rest of your day and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.